the new abnormal reshaping business and supply chain strategy beyond COVID-19. That's the title of a new book by Yossi Sheffi. He is Alicia Gray, the second professor of engineering systems and director of the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. Professor Sheffi, welcome. Hi, Robert, nice to be with you. And good to be with you as well. Now, you very cleverly, in the title to your book, you place the, the ab part of the word abnormal between parentheses. And I'm wondering if you're implying that things will never be normal again, if indeed they ever ever were. What kind of a world are we living in right now? Uh, we're living in the world that's uh, controlled by the pandemic, obviously. It's, um, there are many, many changes going on, and some of them will stay with us for a long time. In general, I believe that uh, this period, 2020, will be looked upon in history, you know, 5, 10, 15 years from now, as an inflection point in business, in society, in government, in education, just like we had big changes after, uh, say, um, after the 930, uh, after the, the depression of 930 brought the rise of the Nazi party, brought uh, a lot of changes in the uh, uh, welfare of the United States. After World War II, we got all this new, we got NATO, we got the UN, we got a lot of new institutions. So, and there are many, many other examples, mm -hmm. but I see this period that we are living through as an inflection point. That many yeah. things will change. Some of them are already changing, some of them will change later. Now, with that in mind, you have spent a career thinking, writing, teaching about risk management and the supply chain. Now, to yes. what extent were you able to draw on your previous lessons and experience in risk management for this book and for your observations of the present day versus to what extent you, did you need to adopt a new perspective given the extraordinary circumstances of a global pandemic? The answer is yes to both. Mm. Um, <laughs> I usually start my presentation saying that uh, Tolstoy said, uh, you know, all happy families are happy in the same way. Unhappy families are unhappy in each other, in its own way. So, okay, so, so now we're in a Russian novel. Okay, fine, continue. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Why not? Disruptions are different. Every disruption is different. But managing disruptions has some of the same elements. And this is where my previous writing was brought into this. For example, you do... Uh, you start an emergency management center that all the information, all the decision making happens in a, in a central place. You start, you, you worry about the, uh, about the money. Cash becomes king when, it, uh, when disruption, usually when affect demand. You worry about your suppliers. Uh, you have to watch. And we also see in every disruption, we see a lot of um, fakes, for example. We just saw a lot of fakes. APEs, a lot of fake uh, masks. You have certain um, principles by which you have to decide which product is built and which supplier get which um, a customer gets the part if you don't have enough for everybody. So all these principles stay the same. Now, this disruption is, of course, fundamentally different than many of the others we had. It's global. It's not in one place. It affects both supply and demand. We are saying we are, we are coming into a world that's not a V or W or whatever letter you want to call it in, to um, characterize the world. I characterize by calling it a whack-a-mole recovery. What we'll see, you know, the whack-a-mole game that you will hit stuff, we will have all over the world regions starting flaring up, the government closing them down, demand is affected, supply is affected, then they open up again and start somewhere else. Random places around the world will start and stop, which is real challenge right now for for supply chain uh, supply chain management. Yeah, well, I mean, we have seen the expected shortages and overages and disruptions and the thing and things that we knew would arise out of a result of a crisis like this. But at the same time, we have seen some remarkable pivot pivots on the part of some manufacturers switching over to make certain types of things like masks and ventilators and the like. And we've seen very creative solutions being brought to bear in the face of this incredible crisis. So what, what would be your report card on supply chains in general in response to this particular okay. pandemic? Do you think that companies I'm, have done an interesting good job in responding? I make a point of saying that supply chain is what I quote Churchill again. It was the finest hour, actually. Mm -hmm. I really think it was the finest hour. 
If you think, for example, just about the food supply chain, the media was full of uh, you know, alarming headlines. I'm talking not about judge report, but about the BBC, <laughs> the New York Times. Uh, shortage developed, pictures of empty um, shelves, uh, not enough eggs, not enough meat, not enough this, not enough that. It's nonsense. For the most part, if you think about, take one example, food. The food supply chain, an unbelievable hit on it because half the food usually goes to institutions, to super, to, to uh, um, uh, universities, uh, restaurants, uh, industrial parks. It comes in big packages. You know, it's not packaged for selling in the supermarket. It doesn't have all the calories on it and all this. It goes just to institution. This was gone at the beginning. So 50% of the uh, of the demand was gone. The demand moved elsewhere, but it not only moved elsewhere. It also changed significantly because people stopped buying fresh produce. They start buying um, bread and pasta and cans, both stuff that sits on the shelf for a long time and stuff that's comfort food. Despite all this, there was no shortage. Sometimes you didn't get the, the cut of meat that you wanted or the flavor of granola bar that you like, but by and large, there was no shortage. So selective and here and just, there. I mean, you know, toilet paper disappeared for a short time and then came back. So it wasn't like a but, length. But, but a lot of it was because of the media. A lot of it because, oh. and I took, I, I have lots of French journalists in the, in the major publications. And I wrote to all of them. I said, you take the pictures at the end of the day. So that you go to the end of the day the supermarket, you see shelves almost empty because people are panicking because of all the you know, media brouhaha. And if you go to the same supermarket in the morning, the shelves are completely full because most of these journalists didn't realize that the cadence of how you supply supermarket. You supply it, you know, the, the trucks leave the warehouse in the evening, they come at night, people take, take the, uh, the pallet, they break the pallet, they put it on the, on the shelf. You don't want to mix customers with the people who are uh, putting stuff on the shelf. So it's done overnight. Mm -hmm. The problem is, and you're laughing at Bob, I cannot tell you how many times I interviewed on several TVs and interviewed with a lot of journalists. I cannot tell you how many times I had this opening line from a journalist. You know, up to today, I was a sports writer. Now they ask me to write about supply chain. <laughs> so this, to me, explains some of it was simply people did not, do not have the background, the context, how yeah. supply chain work. And by the way, one of the greatest for our profession, both you and me and millions other, is that when people used to ask my wife, what's your husband doing? She used to say he's in supply chain and they look at what, her like- What the heck is that? What, during the headlight, what is it? now they don't mm -hmm. even ask. Everybody understands. Well, okay, that's that's the silver lining to this. Even they may be <laughs> ignorant of the subject, but at least they acknowledge that the words exist, and maybe that's that's some. And how important it is. And how yeah, important. but I, I want to talk though also about. I mean, you have long been beating the drum for the need for agility, for flexibility. Ah, the need yes. now, especially the need for speed. But I want to know what the what what the end end result of that need is. Does does the need for speed today? require shorter physical distance between production and delivery and, and markets? For some products, yes, but for many, many products, if you talk about, about manufacturing, I don't see people live in China. And I talk no. to a lot of, I don't see people live mm -hmm. in China. People use decades to build, not a, that's again where the journalists who don't understand supply chain are making a mistake. They think if you move the final assembly plant to the US or to Mexico or to Europe, you move. No, most of the work, most of the value added is in the supply chain, the suppliers and their suppliers and their suppliers. You have a full ecosystem that have been built over decades in China. Mm. People are not going to take them out. It will take decades to build them somewhere else. And, and, and the expertise don't exist. So. People are doing what's called China plus one. You see the, some incremental uh, investment moving out of China. By the way, most of it not to Europe and the United States. They moved to um, uh, Vietnam, they moved to Malaysia, they moved to countries in the region. A lot of it could have been moving to Mexico, talking about US companies, 
if the Mexican business climate would have been better, mm -hmm. I think AMLO, the, the, the president is using, this was a unique opportunity to move a lot of business to Mexico, which companies are hesitating, not yeah. only because, because of, the, of the security, because of the anti-business climate. Mm -hmm. So I don't see too much, some will move for sure, companies will balance, by the way, I talk to companies that are only in the US who say they need to balance it and put it some put some uh, manufacturing and suppliers somewhere else. And one thing to remember, especially in a pandemic like this, you don't want all your eggs in one basket. In right. fact, globalization and spread bring resilience because you can some plants are on, some plants are off. It's exactly this whack-a-mole that you don't want to be in a situation that all your stuff is in Northern Italy and it closes up, that's it. Yeah. A, a lesson yeah. that you, you would wonder if that companies had learned in the last decade with various okay. natural yeah. disasters yeah. and tsunamis and earthquakes and the like, but okay, yes. so China plus one, I get it. Also companies going back to some level, higher level of safety stock, of buffer stock, just in time, I don't believe you would argue just in time is dead. In fact, you say no. in the book the need for tweaking just in time. Yes. What do you exactly. mean by that? Okay, just in time, the, the, um, the origin of the or the origin of just in time is the Toyota production system, of course. Mm -hmm. So it brought immense benefits. I think it was as big a revolution in, in manufacturing as the industrial revolution or close to it. So it's not gonna go away. It brought us high quality worker participation and low waste and, and, and also responsiveness to the market by connecting better suppliers and, and, uh, um, and manufacturers and retailers. Now, you can run it with extra supply chain, with extra inventory, safety stock, using several conditions. First of all, by the way, I should say that it's not easy to do in a competitive industry because you'll become less competitive. So let's talk about critical supplies and let's distinguish those from, if you want more Legos for your, uh, you know, if a retailer wants to keep more Lego, I don't think they will. It's you don't think expensive. Legos are critical? Okay, well, we'll just assume uh, that. Not critical for we'll most We'll stipulate people. that, continue. Okay, <laughs> I don't know why I said Lego. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. However, there are critical supplies and they are not only PPEs, they are not only um, uh, other medical supplies, there are some chips, there are some, there are, the government has to define what's critical and then it's incumbent on the government to keep the inventory. What do I mean to keep the inventory? The inventory does not have to resign in government warehouses. In fact, it should not. It should become part of what the distributor, for example, have. Now, the only thing that the government, should, the government should pay for the extra inventory, uh, inventory holding costs, but the one thing that the government should insist on is that those who hold the inventory cannot use it for day to day. So they oh. cannot, because one of the problems of this inventory is that it creates low quality because it's too easy to get one from the pile when you have a problem. Unlike the Toyota system, that you find the root of the problem immediately when there's a problem, mm -hmm. when, uh, when you see a defect. People will not be allowed to use it unless they get presidential approval or some high level approval, just like we used to run the strategic oil reserve. I was going to say, it's just it's like the oil, you know, it's, exactly. it's there in time of emergency, not for today's needs. Yeah. Exactly. And right. this is how we should, by the way, when we talk about medical supply, the reason they say it should kept with the uh, uh, distributors, for example, is it has to be live inventory. It has to move all the time because otherwise yeah. it, will, it, it will expire. But you can simply set a higher um, red line in the system. So when a hospital orders something, they may be out of stock. They're not really out of stock. They require, let's say the president or the governor approval to release this, uh, uh, this stock. So it's, with a few tweaks, you can run, you can get all the benefit of just in time without the problem that very high inventory gives you. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you are really proposing a very creative melding of past practice and new thinking all together in this in this in this look in a, in a way of looking at this new world and what you call an all seeing no touch fu future, which I think is a fascinating <laughs> concept, too. Uh, I want to say again the name of the book, The New 
abnormal, reshaping business and supply chain strategy beyond COVID-19. Yossi Sheffi, always a joy to speak with you. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Bob. Enjoy.